So welcome everybody, both in the Zoom world and also here in the room. Today we have uh, our third candidate for the Forest Science and Climate Change uh, position, Mike Kutz. We're thrilled to have him here. He's currently a research scientist with the Earth Lab Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, Mike got his PhD in ecology at UC Davis in 2019, Master of Science in Ecology in Colorado State in 2014, and then a Bachelor of Science in Biology, University of Hawaii, Hilo, so on the Big Island, in 2009. He has 16 papers, um, including manuscripts in ecosphere methods in ecology and evolution, nature, ecology letters, remote sensing, landscape ecology, proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, among others. And his research is focused on characterizing the drivers of wildfire and forest insect disturbances at missing scales, which is kind of interesting, distilling innovative research approaches to democratize uh, access to macroecology, and understanding climate change and land management influences on planet ecology at socio-ecological scales. So welcome, Mike. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. And, uh... Yeah, thank you all for being here. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be here to share some of my work with you and to share sort of the, the vision for the lab that I would hope to build here at Essen with a focus on the title of this slide. So demography and disturbance across scales, forest resilience, and then in a changing climate. Before we go further, I want to acknowledge the land on which I'm presenting and on which I've conducted my research. And so I'll start with this UC Berkeley specific statement, and I don't want to miss any part of it, so I'm just going to read it. So I recognize that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of the Pichun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Muwekma Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. I recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution founding in 1868. And consistent with UC Berkeley's and my values of community inclusion and, and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship with Native peoples. As a member of the Berkeley community during my visit, it's vitally important that I not only recognize the history of the land on which I stand, but also to recognize that the Moekma Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. So in a broader sense too, the work I'm gonna present takes place on unceded territory of a number, a number of other Native American tribes across California, the Western US and the globe. And this is really important context for the work that I do because the ongoing history of Native people is intimately tied to forest disturbance ecology, particularly fire ecology. So all disturbance regimes have this human influence. And when we talk about the effect of climate change on disturbance regimes globally or the effect of fire suppression, on disturbance regime in California, we're, we're necessarily talking about the settler colonialism that has altered these systems. And two, as a content warning for this talk, I'm gonna be discussing a few specific fire events uh, that were pretty traumatic in California and Colorado over the past few years. So just to uh, so that you have that information ahead of time. So I'll start with a bit more about who I am as a scientist. So I'm a forest ecologist, and I study how disturbance and demography operate across scales to shape ecosystem resilience, particularly in the context of a changing climate and land management. And I combine a firm grounding in ecological theory with cutting edge geospatial data analytics using R, QGIS, Amazon Web Services, STAN, and Google Earth Engine, and open science ethos to make research more accessible with more open data work, with open data and workflows hands-on inclusive pedagogy and collaborations across both researcher and manager stakeholders. And harmonization of diverse data streams from field work to drones to satellites and across spatial and temporal scales from individual plants up to ecosystems and from hours to decades to generate fresh insights into disturbance prone systems and the persistence of those systems in the Western US. Now major, major motivation for this research is that forests are these spatially vast, long-lived systems, but they've got these elements and these properties that combine and interact and emerge across scales. So for instance, the decisions that an individual bark beetle will make about which tree to attack next over the space of just a few meters can have implications for landscape scale mass tree mortality events. But by integrating information across scales, we can refine our understanding of forest functioning in the past, present, and future. And by applying these cross-scale data intensive approaches, we can ask and answer questions that were previously intractable, right? We can fundamentally change the scope 
of our research. So some of my work is at a global scale, but my focus is forests of the Western US. And a key feature of these forests is they are disturbance prone. So tens of thousands of hectares of these forests are affected by wildfire, bark beetle attacks every single year. And we know that disturbance regimes are changing in the Western US, right? With climate change and a history of fire suppression. So climate change makes the atmosphere hotter and drier. And fire suppression has allowed forests to densify and homogenize, which increases the amount and the connectivity of fuel on the landscape. So this makes disturbance events faster and larger and more severe to the point where there's this real threat. We might lose a lot of our forests to type conversions, grasslands or shrublands. And there's also this real threat to the livelihoods of people that live and work and play in and near these disturbance prone systems. So this research is critical because we need to understand these threats in order to make informed decisions about how to best manage and adapt to them. So in this era of intensifying disturbances and climate change threats to mountainous forest ecosystems of the Western US and in California, this department would be an ideal place to continue my research, my use inspired basic research on cross scale ecosystem ecology and to train the next generation of data literate ecologists. So my current research on the program that I would aspire to build here at Berkeley Pursue science that is innovative, open, and collaborative with these three broad themes. So first, disturbance dynamics and missing scales of observation. Second, democratizing access to macroecology research. And third, basic forest and climate change science that we can use. So throughout my presentation, uh, in the bottom left of each slide, it's going to be one of these three symbols to sort of represent the theme that I'm talking about. So this first symbol of the earth and the clock represents missing observations at different space and time scales. And the second, I've done here uh, with the hands and the mountain symbolizes people working together to understand landscapes. And this third symbol with the set of tools and the drone symbolizes the, the union of cutting edge methods and shovel ready management action. So the first theme, understanding disturbance dynamics and missing scales of observation. So to do this, we need to understand phenomenon across broad extents, but also with fine granularity. And this is really challenging. Right, so usually we've got this trade-off between the amount of area that we can, uh, the amount of detail that we can resolve, and the amount of area over which we can resolve that detail. So this is why the, the sort of broad extent fine grain observational domain is, is relatively understudied. But this theme is all about creative approaches to overcoming that extent grain trade-off, and we can think of this extent grain trade-off in space, with broad extent referring to coverage of a large area. Uh, but fine grain, meaning that we can resolve small details within that broad area, like individual plants. And we can think of the extent grain trade off in time, too, where uh, broad extent means covering a long time period. Um, and then the fine grain means that we can capture information at a high temporal frequency, like hourly weather data. So, first, I'll talk about space by highlighting this paper published last year in Nature Communications. Entitled Cross Scale Interaction of Post Tree Size and Climatic Water Deficit Governs Bark Beetle Induced Tree Mortality. So, for this work, I led a team of Forest Service and University collaborators, starting with a successful funding proposal to the Forest Service to investigate a forest disturbance dynamic that occurred at vastly different spatial scales. So, from just a few meters in between individual trees to a 350 kilometer latitudinal gradient. And that system was the western pine beetle, which attacked and killed live ponderosa pine trees in the hot drought of 2012 and 2016. So these beetles, they dealt the final blow to tens of millions of ponderosa pine trees killed in that hot drought. Conservatively, the 2012 to 2016 hot drought was a 1 in 10,000 year old with dry conditions coinciding with particularly warm temperatures. And, and I used to be able to say California's recent hot drought, but the last two years of perhaps even more dire conditions has really highlighted that the 2012 2016 event was a harbinger of climate change effects to come. So this hot drought led to a mass tree mortality event, which with much of the mortality in yellow pine mixed conifer forests attributed to this western pine beetle. And this figure here borrowed from Young et al. 2017 does a really nice job of sort of showcasing this broad mortality gradient with more red pixels representing more mortality and greener pixels representing less mortality. And so we can see that the redder, more mortality occurred in these hotter, drier sites. So hot, dry conditions make these beetles, or sorry, make these trees more susceptible to beetle attack, right? The uh, 
the water stress trees have a less of a capacity to sort of repel these beetles. They, their main defense mechanism is, is compromised when they're under water stress. But these beetles are also responding to forest structure and composition at a much more local scale than this sort of broad extent mortality gradient might suggest. So by forest composition, I of course mean the tree species that are present. And by forest structure, I mean the physical arrangement of biomass in the forest. So for instance, how far apart or how spaced the trees are, how big or how small those trees are too. So to illustrate some of these local forest structure composition effects, I'm gonna show you a cartoon-like history of the Western pine beetle. So first, these beetles are almost exclusively attacking ponderosa pine trees. So their, their distribution is sort of limited to where ponderosa pine is on the landscape. And they have a hard time finding and attacking uh, their host trees when there are non-host trees present. So there's a local force composition effect. And these beetles would like to attack the biggest tree possible, right? The big trees represent a more nutritious resource, but these big trees are also dangerous prey, right? And so they can typically, under normal water conditions, mount a stronger defense. So first, Beetle will fly to a potential host tree to try to determine whether it is susceptible to, to attack, whether it's under water stress or not. But these beetles can't disperse very far. And the longer time they're flying, the more exposed they are to predators, right? So the closer the trees are, the closer the host trees are, uh, the easier and safer it is for them to reach those trees. If that tree is susceptible to attack, that beetle will start boring into the inner bark and it will release a chemical signal to attract additional cost specifics to and a mass attack to sort of overwhelm that tree's defenses. And when that tree's at carrying capacity of its beetles, an anti-aggregation pheromone will be released to sort of prevent further colonization. But this chemical signaling is pretty short range, right? And it's susceptible to wind patterns and that sort of thing underneath the canopy. So that uh, in sparser, more open canopies, it's more easily disrupted by the wind. So these beetles will mate, lay eggs in galleries in the inner bark in this sort of sinuous pattern like that. And then they'll die, the adults will die. And over a period of six to eight weeks, those eggs will develop with the larvae eating the phloem of the tree. And then the next generation of adults will emerge and fly off to find a new host, leaving that first tree to die. So to capture this local disturbance phenomenon, we need to be able to measure the local forest structure and the composition, but to, measure, to capture this sort of broader scale phenomenon, we need to sample across a broad gradient. But as we said, collecting broad extent fine grain data prevents a data acquisition challenge, right? So to meet this challenge, I partnered with the Forest Service to augment their field sampling across the Sierra Nevada mountain range of California with drone data collection. So 32 field sites on a 350 kilometer latitudinal gradient, we installed five tenth of, it, tenth of an uh, acre plots. And at each of these plots, we took field measurements, right? The location and the stem size and the species of each tree. And then we autopsied each dead tree to sort of confirm its agent of mortality. And then we used drone-based multispectral imaging to augment this individual tree scale data at each site. So at each of these 32 sites, we pre-programmed this autonomous flight in this sort of lawnmower pattern here that you see in the bottom left, taking pictures along the way. So at each of these sites, we're capturing about 2,000 images, and it takes about five different flights and about 80 minutes of flight time to cover this 30 hectares. But importantly, there's a lot of overlap between these images, right? So these two-dimensional images are capturing the tree from lots of different angles. With special software, we use a technique called structure from motion photogrammetry to infer the three-dimensionality of the forest scene using these overlapping two-dimensional images. So two outputs of that processing are an ortho mosaic, a sort of top-down uh, top view of the entire survey scene like you see up here. And importantly, the spatial relationships between the objects in the scene are all preserved. So we can do measurements on this photo. And the other output is a three-dimensional point cloud with the heights of each of these objects calculated. So here's what that looks like for this forest. So remember this came from 2000 individual overlapping two-dimensional images processed using this structure from motion photogrammetry software. And it took about 80 minutes of flight time to capture this. And we have 32 sites worth of data just like this. So 
to give you a sense of scale here, here's an example ortho mosaic from one of these 32 sites. So that's that top down view of the survey scheme. And these are the five tenth of an acre survey plots that we've installed, drawn to scale, right? So we've augmented our field data collection by a factor of 150. So with some additional data processing steps and validation against the field data, we can use the three-dimensional point cloud and the reflectance from the multispectral imagery to generate stem maps and assign attributes to each of these individual trees. Attributes like height, whether the tree was alive or dead, or whether the tree was a host or a non-host, whether it was ponderosa pine or some other species. So with this approach, we were able to map over nine square kilometers of forest along this really fast 350 kilometer latitudinal gradient and identify, measure, and classify over 400,000 trees in a single field season. With those data, we can apply a logistic regression to model the probability of host tree mortality using some of these local forest structure and composition attributes, and then this sort of broader scale regional climatic water deficit, and then the interaction between those two. So we found that it's the host tree proportion and the host tree density that really drives host mortality. So here on the x-axis is the proportion of host trees and the probability of host tree mortality on the y, a clear increasing relationship. And then larger trees are depicted in brown and smaller trees in blue, which shows us that, the, uh, that there's a strong effect of host tree size as well, right? With the larger trees being generally associated with greater probability of tree mortality. But critically, we found a strong interaction between this local scale host tree size and the broad scale climatic water deficit in their effect on tree mortality. So this is that cross scale interaction alluded to in the title of the paper. So in cool wet sites, the effect of host tree size doesn't play much of a role here. We've got a similar relationship uh, between those two lines, the larger trees and the smaller trees. But we really see this effect in the hot dry sites where it was really the largest trees that drove tree mortality. So to emphasize here, the effect of the local scale host tree size depended on this broad scale climatic water deficit. And this suggests that the Western pine beetle was responding to different characteristics of forest structure across this mortality or rather across this water balance gradient. So some takeaways for this particular paper. So we found that both local and broad scale drivers were important predictors of tree mortality. And drones helped us measure both of these scales simultaneously, which is also what allowed us to measure their interaction. And getting at this cross scale interaction of these drivers teaches us more about the positive feedbacks associated with forest insect outbreaks. Understanding these cross scale drivers can help forest managers refine expectations of tree mortality during hot track. So we can also think about missing temporal scales of observation. So before we talked about missing observational scales in space, and here we're gonna talk about missing scales of observation in time. So here I'm gonna highlight a collaborative effort to understand fire activity on a sub-daily scale across the whole globe. And I led key pieces of this data analytics for this paper as a equally contributing second author. So specifically, we were interested in understanding fire activity at night. So nighttime conditions usually brings lower temperatures and lower vapor pressure deficit, which is this measure of atmospheric aridity, essentially how quickly the atmosphere can dry out fuel. We typically think of uh, dead vegetation as the, as the fuel that's most responsive to a BPD. So fires typically lie low at night, and it's a familiar phenomenon in fire suppression operations and in cultural burning practices across the globe to sort of use the expectation that the nighttime can be a barrier to fire spread. But DPD is a function of temperature, and the nights have warmed more than the days over the last 70 years. So how does that affect the nighttime fire? Find out, we need to understand the effect of DPD on fire activity at both hourly and decadal time scales. So first, we set out to characterize the global nighttime fire regime. So the longest and most consistent record of sub-daily fire activity comes from the MODIS instruments. So these overpass every point on Earth about four times, twice during the day and twice at night. And this figure summarizes over 80 million active fire detections over an 18-year period to show that there's substantial nighttime fire activity, particularly in the Western US. 
But now let's think about how changing VPD, so vapor pressure deficit, that's a measure of atmospheric aridity. How does that influence fire activity? And we can start by dipping into this on an hourly scale. So this plot depicts the time series of hourly VPD through the course of the 2017 Tubbs fire, which burned through Santa Rosa. So the x-axis here is time. These date labels are at midnight local time. The blue dots are nighttime hours, and the red dots are daytime hours. So the first thing to notice is this very clear diurnal oscillation where VPD drops down low during the night, making the night generally less flammable. But the second thing to notice is this point here. So the night of October 8th and the early morning hours of October 9th, VPD stayed very high, right? VPD did not drop down as low as it did for the other nights. So now let's look at VPD paired with the hourly progression of the Tubbs fire itself. So if you recall, the Tubbs fire ignited in the late evening hours of uh, October 8th in 2017, committed this harrowing one in the early morning hours of October 9th through the town of Santa Rosa. And here's that high VCD that we saw in the previous plot. And these, this, let me back up. So this, uh, at the top of the active fire counts from the GOES satellite, and on the bottom is that same plot that we just saw with the hourly VPD measurement. So that early morning run is depicted here in these blue dots on the top. And here's what we just saw where VPD stayed very high that night. So those nighttime atmospheric conditions were one mechanism that allowed this fire to spread as quickly as it did at night. So night is supposed to be this barrier to fire spread, right? But the atmospheric conditions that night were still flammable, right? And so that seems that seems scary, right? And dangerous. But we wanted to know whether that was a dangerous or whether that was a, a general trend. So to find out, let's scale this up. So we collated almost half a terabyte of GO16 imagery over a three-year period. That's almost over 150,000 images. And each image depicts the active fire detections at a two kilometer spatial resolution. And it takes an image four to six times per hour. We delineated over 8,000 fire events over the Western hemisphere using a new spatial temporal clustering algorithm on a different satellite product. And the centroids of those 80,000 fire events are depicted here on top of those imagery. We extracted the hourly VPD, that vapor pressure deficit, for each of these fire events for the entire event's duration, and then paired those observations with the hourly fire activity from the, from the GO satellite. So this amounted to over 13 million observations of VPD matched this hourly measure of fire activity. For 25 different land covers across that uh, Western hemisphere, we modeled the probability of a fire detection within an hour as a function of that instantaneous vapor pressure deficit during that hour. And we see this clear increase in relationship, right? Increasing VPD makes it much more likely that you're gonna see an active fire detection. So here's one missing scale that we build in, right? We've linked changing atmospheric conditions to changing fire activity on an hourly time step and across the whole hemisphere. So now let's look across decades. So we used our hourly model to develop thresholds of VPD below which fire detections were very rare. So when an hourly VPD is above that threshold, that's a flammable hour. And when the hourly VPD stays above that threshold all night long, that's a flammable night. And we wanted to know essentially how many hourly, how many flammable hours are there at each point on earth over this 40 year record? And how has that changed over that time period? So this top map depicts the change in the number of flammable nighttime hours within a year with brown or colors representing a greater increase of flammable hours. And this bottom map depicts the change in the number of flammable nights uh, through, through the course of a year. And again, this is, this is sort of uh, looking over this 40 year record. And it's not your imagination that the Western US is very brown, right? So in the Western US specifically, we saw an increase the number of flammable nights of 11, which is a 45% increase compared to 40 years ago. So that's the trend in VPD, but we also show a clear increasing trend in the percent of detections at night and a clear increasing trend depicted in the bottom right here of increasing nighttime fire intensity, right? And that's notably different than the decreasing trends in daytime fire intensity over this 18 year record. 
So finally, putting these pieces together, we see that the increase in nighttime fire intensity only occurs in the places where there's been a climatological shift, right, of increasing flame and increase in flammable nights. So here on the left facet, these are all of the areas that have an increase in flammable nights, and we see an increase in nighttime fire intensity. And on the right, we see no trend in nighttime fire intensity in places where there's no increase in flammable nights. So the upshot is this, we're losing the night breaks on wildfire. And this is another mechanism that we might expect fires to last longer, to become more intense and to grow larger. And this is sort of an insidious climate change effect that we were really only able to disentangle by looking at these hourly and decadal time steps. And finally, another reason why I wanted to highlight this paper is it's an example of sort of large interdisciplinary team science that I think is really important going forward for forest and climate change research. So that brings me to my next theme, which is democratizing access to macroecology research. And so by macroecology, I mean the study of a spatially vast system whose biological and biophysical and social components interact dynamically both within and across time, space and time scales. And I think some of my research, including some of the work that I just showed, fits pretty neatly into this subdiscipline. So as I mentioned before, when talking about drones and bark beetles, Collecting this fine grained broad extent data is really challenging, right? And it can also be really inaccessible, right? It requires specialized equipment or uh, you know, specialized knowledge and data science skills. But a core part of my research philosophy is that macroecology is for everyone. And so I bring this open science ethos to democratize the field, right? The intention is to allow anyone that wants to access to this part of the research dialogue. And I do that by developing new methods publishing papers in open access journals and accompanying those publications with open data and open code. So this, and it's, it's documented, right? It's well documented, it's organized, and it's open and publicly available. So this shows the, uh, the data organization scheme for that drone bark beetle paper. This is sort of how I helped readers and, and myself wrangle and make sense of this one and a quarter terabytes of information that we collected in that project. And it's all publicly available, right? One and a quarter terabytes publicly available in the open science framework for anybody to use. So it represents this sort of snapshot of tree mortality in 2018 uh, from that 2012 to 2016 hot trail. So I bring these data science skills to bear on my research, but I also have the skill set to teach them to other researchers. I've been a carpentries instructor for over six years, teaching open environmental data science skills to industry and academic uh, and government researchers that are new to this, uh, new to scientific computing. So for instance, this R. Davis course is one that I co-wrote and co-led in 2017 for my fellow grad students at UC Davis. And by the end of the quarter, it was adopted as part of the required curriculum for the UC Davis graduate group in ecology. I've also been on the leadership team of Gloria Great Basin since 2016, or 2017 rather. So this is a research and education nonprofit whose mission is to understand climate change effects to alpine plants and also to educate the public about these climate change threats to mountaintop species. So we monitor eight target regions throughout the Great Basin area shown here in the bottom left. And at each of these sites, there's three to four mountaintops that we survey on a cycle of every five years or so with the lowest elevation mountaintop uh, sort of encapsulating both the, uh, the subalpine forest and the and the alpine plants, right? So we're capturing this sort of alpine forest ecotone. And this is a community science project. So we immerse volunteers coming from a variety of backgrounds in the survey methods and in the plant identification. And we also subsidize student participation. It's a regional chapter of an international effort, right? And the sort of core uh, intention of this, part of this international effort was to design a survey approach that could be done with very low budget. We literally use string and a compass as sort of demarcator survey area. And that's so that more people can get involved in doing these kinds of surveys across the world. So this lets us capture fine scale vegetation data on each summit, but then use this collaborative, collaborative process of standardized protocols to scale up our research. And one manuscript I want to highlight within this particular theme is this one, which is just accepted in Ecosphere. It's called Democratizing Macroecology, Integrating Unoccupied Aerial Systems with the National Ecological Observatory Network. 
Uh, and it arose from conversations at the inaugural Neon Science Summit in 2019. So at that meeting, a group of drone and neon using scientists put our heads together and sort of made this connection that, that drones and neon have a lot in common, right? They're both these tools from macroecology that let us survey over vast spatial extents at a fairly uh, fine resolution. And as we mentioned before, macroecology can be pretty inaccessible, right? But both of these are tools are, are revolutionary sort of in their, in their way that they uh, can broaden access to this kind of research. They're also complementary. So NEON offers this consistent, high quality, long-term record, but it's pretty inflexible, right? The data is gonna be collected at the same place in the same way for 30 years. Um, on the other hand though, drone data collection is, is highly flexible, but it lacks the data standards and workflows uh, that make NEON so great. So with this paper, we aim to lower the barrier to entry for using drones and ecology to do macroecology, for using drones and neon to do macroecology. And we did that by providing a mental model and an open workflow for how to use these tools together. So our mental model includes 10 core principles for integrating drone and neon data. And within these principles, we sort of packed in decades of hard-won practical knowledge from the collective expertise of the group. Then we described how we considered each of these principles in an actual drone operation over an hour rich uh, neon site. So these core principles start with considering the science requirements, right? What are the actual data that we need to collect to answer the specific science question? And they take you all the way through data processing. And some of the decisions around these 10 core principles sort of force your hand down the road for some of the other core, some of the other core principles, right? So it's sort of helpful to understand what that whole process might look like. Um, before you before you get started and, and make the decisions in the first place. And the hope is that it lets you see what that process is at the start so that you can sort of work towards a, a slightly less mysterious end goal. So building on the idea of bringing people together to, to sort of build bridges across disparate uses of a, of a macroecology tool here, I'm a co-PI on this interview NSF research coordination network proposal with colleagues at Duke and the University of Vermont. And this project would support a series of meetings over three years to build an inclusive community of practice for using drone data and with an eye to making them fair, so findable, accessible, uh, interoperable, and reusable, but also ethical. And so it would also support this data science internship for students to put some of these uh, principles that we come up with into practice. So importantly, we already have buy-in from a lot of different folks with a variety of uh, expertise from drone data science or from drone data collection, rather, to data science, to data standards, to data ethics. So the takeaways for this theme, first, macroecology is for everyone. <laughs> Second, open data, code, and manuscripts allow more people to participate in the research dialogue. Third, teaching environmental data science skills is itself a distinct skill that can uh, broaden access to this field. Fourth, building collaborations can scale up our research. And finally, open workflows and mental models for using macroecology macro tools can democratize the field. So the final theme I wanna to touch on is basic forest and climate change science that we can use. And I consider my work to be use-inspired basic research, right? Because it both advances our fundamental understanding of forest science while also providing actionable management insights. To highlight the theme, I want to talk about this paper. Local forest structure variability increases resilience to wildfire and dry western US coniferous forests. And our study system for this paper was seasonally dry yellow pine mixed conifer in the Sierra Nevada. We wanted to better understand a sort of proposed mechanism for the persistence, the long-term persistence of this system uh, because it's so disturbance prone. And so resilience can be pretty hard to operationalize, right? So the way that we put theory into practice was by focusing on resistance, which is one of the components of resilience, meaning the ease or difficulty of changing the system. So in the context of our system, we consider a change to be the deaths of overstory trees. That, that represents a, a system state change. Now, an emerging paradigm for this particular system is that the variability in vegetation structure can make a forest more resilient to wildfire, making fire less intense when it burns and reducing the mortality of overstory trees. So this drawing shows a locally variable forest with clumps of trees and gaps between them. 
And this heterogeneous forest structure can interrupt fuel continuity and make it harder for a canopy, canopy fire to spread. It makes it harder for fire to get into the canopy and then spread through the canopy, which is what kills those trees. So this is a fairly simple hypothesis, right? That looks like this relationship, right? We expect more variable forest to have fewer trees dead from fire. But the challenge is that if one asks these fundamental questions about the system, then we need to measure the whole system. So we overcame this challenge with satellite imagery from the Landsat series. And folks have used satellites for decades to measure tree mortality from wildfire by essentially taking an image before the fire and an image after the fire and subtracting one from the other, right? This is a very labor intensive process that requires a GIS analyst to go pick through a Landsat image one by one to find one that's mostly cloud free and then to do the same for the after fire image in order to do that math. So what we added was an ability to do that programmatically with the Google Earth Engine platform. So for the, which for the, the Sierra Nevada mountain range of California, this is one of the most highly studied fire systems in the world. We doubled the amount of information that we can use to test this hypothesis. So we now had access to over a thousand fires and the severity information and the local forest structure information between 1984 and 2018. And we found that our method, right, of getting this wildfire induced tree mortality validates as well or better against field reference data compared to that by hand method that was so labor intensive. So we can measure tree mortality from satellites. But what about local forest variability? So for this, we use a technique from computer vision called texture analysis, where we that we apply to the Landsat imagery. So we describe so texture analysis is, is where we describe each pixel in an image as a summary statistic of its neighbors. And because we're interested in forest variability, we're going to use standard deviation as our summary statistic. So here's how this works. We start with an image that represents some proxy for vegetation cover, vegetation density at each pixel. You can define a neighborhood window and then calculate the standard deviation of the pixel values within that window. And then we can apply that process to every single pixel in the image. So a greater standard deviation in that neighborhood would represent greater forest structural variability. So here's what that forest variability looks like. So on the top is a heterogeneous forest that we saw before in that drawing with the clumps of trees and the gaps between them. And then below this image here is what the satellite sees. So comparing the top row here to the bottom row, they've got the same average value for that vegetation density, vegetation cover metric, but the bottom has a much higher standard deviation. So the bottom is a more heterogeneously structured forest and the top is a more homogeneously structured forest. So to illustrate the value of this approach, I'm going to narrate this short video showing a web app that I built to visualize the Google Earth Engine data analytics for this paper. So we're going to open up the app. This sort of gray polygon is the Sierra Nevada ecoregion, and the purple in the inside is our study system, right? The yellow pine mixed conifer forest. And I should say, so this is a video, but it's running in, in real time, right? So it's, it's not sped up or anything. So we're going to pick a conspicuous fire year. We're going to go with 2013. And we're going to zoom into a fire that you might recognize. This is the Grim Fire, which at the time when it burned in 2013 was the biggest fire ever recorded in the Sierra Nevada. Uh, and it was sort of shocking to a lot of forest ecologists in sort of its how big it got, how fast it moved, and how severe it was. So right now what this algorithm is doing in real time is it's combing through the Landsat catalog. It's filtering out all of the imagery just prior to the fire. It's flying some cloud masks to each pixel. And then it's collapsing those pre-fire images into a single pre-fire image composite. And then it goes to the end, right? So it's, it's already finished now, right? So then it goes one year after the fire and it does the same thing, right? It collapses these close fire images into a single close fire image. And then it populates on our screen with this map of severity. So again, this is, this is very fast, right? This is something that, that would have taken a lot of hand curation in the past. So now we can start by getting, start the analytics for getting our, our local forest structure variability metric, which right now on the fly, it's going back, getting that pre-fire image, applying that uh, cloud mask to each of those, compositing them as well, and then applying that texture analysis, right? To populate here on the map with whiter colors representing more structural variability and blacker colors representing more homogeneous forest. So we do this for this full record of over a thousand fires in the system since 1984. And now we've got this sort of system-wide pairing of tree mortality from fire and this local structure variability. And 
And with this enhanced data set, we really capture a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the study system that we're aiming to understand. So the fires we're able to measure were on the left here. The yellow pine mixed conifer forest system is in the middle. And on the right are all of the samples that we took from those fires that we used in our modeling. So we use a logistic regression to predict the probability of high severity fire as a function of some typical drivers like fuel moisture, vegetation cover, and annual heat load, which is the sort of topographic effect. And uh, right, and then we also added this newly calculated local forest structural variability metric. And we see the expected relationships between typically studied variables, right, and fire severity. But our focus was on this whole structure effect where we're trying to test this really simple hypothesis and would expect this relationship if it's true. And that's exactly what we see, right? So this effect is also pretty sizable, right? It's on par with that topographic effect of annual heat load. So the takeaways for this theme are one, that local forest variability reduces the likelihood of high security fire. Two, a landscape scale, this is this work represents a landscape scale framework to manage for resilience by influencing local forest structure with things like prescribed fire, mechanical thinning, things that we know make that forest structure more, more heterogeneous. And in fact, this work has already been used to support policy documents arguing for this kind of resilience focused management in the, uh, from a couple of places, the California Fire Science Consortium and the Bonato Declaration, which is a call to action among diverse stakeholders across California to save California's forests. And all of this is important because the threats to forests are spatially vast, but the management intervention often has to be pretty local and targeted. So it's testament to the strength of this sort of broad extent, fine grain approach. One project I'm really excited to be spinning up is a collaboration with Yosemite National Park to develop fine scale map of tree mortality risk. This is also building that park, Beetle you know, Park, that I've discussed before. So building on these three themes, the disturbance dynamics and missing scales of observation, democratizing access to macroecology research, and basic forest and climate change science we can use. I want to talk a bit more about the future directions for the lab that I would hope to build here at SLM. So I'm currently the Sea Boulder Principal Investigator on a Moore Foundation study that seeks to systematically understand and identify extreme fire events in California. So this plot here shows all of the 3,500 events uh, in California, we've our data set, and the red ones are the ones that we have identified as extreme events. And this kind of work is really important, right, for understanding fire at more socio-ecologically relevant scale, right, as fire moves from day to day across our landscape, rather than just looking sort of as its final perimeter or its final burned area. But there's certainly more that we can and should look at, especially aiming to observe and understand fire progression at, at sub-daily scales. So this kind of work is necessary to get a finer scale fire spread and driver information. Uh, oh, sorry, so the kind of work that this would uh, require, right, gets it to get at these finer scales. It would be really ideal for grad students and postdocs, right? It's like a, a nice combination of, of chapter or paper size, technical challenges and questions, but also this sort of broad overarching theme of, of understanding fire progression in a landscape that is heterogeneous in both space and time. And I'll also say that it's a, it's a reasonably safe bet to assume that there will be more funding opportunities for forest and fire science re research, right? The research budgets for the Moore Foundation, NSF, JFSP, the Joint Fire Science Program, and Cal Fire are sort of all increasing uh, in order to look more at these kinds of issues. So I also built relationships with the Calwood Education Center after the devastating Calwood fire of 2020. So this burned just outside of Boulder, Colorado. And the Calwood Education Center is this outdoor school that served the Latino communities of Colorado's Front Range for over 40 years. Uh, and this was a pretty devastating climate change-like event, right? So there, there were high winds that particular day. This fire moved very quickly right through the property and burned down into the wildland urban interface. It impacted a lot of people. And the winds were fast, but that's pretty typical for that time of year. But it coincided with really abnormally hot and dry conditions. And as I mentioned, it, it impacted a lot of a lot of folks, right? I could walk to a hill near my house and see the see the flaming front, and then of course the, the smoke impacts and the evacuation impacts were, were even more sensitive than that. So it was this traumatic event for Boulder County, but also this opportunity. So I contributed experiential learning opportunities and programming for the Calwood Education Center at Calwood to showcase how we might use drones to understand forest science 
and fire ecology in that area using sort of this, this singular event, this visceral experience that, uh, that we all shared uh, as, a, as a foundation. I've also served on the advisory board to the board of directors for this particular nonprofit as they sort of pivot their education mission to also include research from local experts. Uh, and I led the effort to drum map the 300 hectare fire star at an individual tree scale. So this is to assess the effect of uh, pre-fire treatments on fire severity and to uh, guide future restoration and also to sort of provide a base map for collaborative efforts amongst other scientists that might wish to build some kind of project in that area. So we hope to build similar kinds of relationships in California, like with the UC Berkeley Forestry Field Camp, uh, or perhaps the Pepperwood Preserve, which was impacted by both the 2017 Tubbs Fire and the 2019 Kincaid Fire. Now, as a confluence of these three themes that I've been talking about, I'm, I'm really excited to talk about this project that's going to be spinning up in the fall of 2022. This is the Open Force Observatory that we are starting up with uh, Derek Young at UC Davis and Tyson Sweatman at Cybers and University of Arizona. So the OFO is a NSF-funded effort to build cyber infrastructure for using drones and artificial intelligence to create large-scale force inventories across the Western US. So we're going to build those kinds of workflows. We're going to initiate the OFO with data collection over field reference plots and these drone AI-derived uh, force inventories with partnerships with the Forest Service, the Nature Conservancy, and NEON. And then there's this strong outreach and education component. Where we're going to build on our relationships with Calwood, expand that programming, uh, and have data science internships uh, and postdoc support. And so again, I'd be excited to, excited to partner with UC Berkeley and the assets here to bring the OFO to Berkeley as well and to the ex, uh, experimental forests, uh, perhaps with the California Heartbeat Initiative. Uh, and I think that you know students affiliated with this with this new Schmidt Center of Environmental Data Science or of, of uh, data science in the environment, right? Would, could really benefit too from some of these open workflows that we're going to be building. So wrapping up here, I'm really eager to support students and trainees as we lead new research that seeks to understand some of these critical issues facing California. So my work represents use-inspired basic research that both advances our fundamental understanding of force and climate change science, while also providing actionable insights for how to manage these forests and adapt to a changing climate. So this work is highly relevant to California and the Western US as the societal challenges associated with forests are spatially vast and temporally vast, but often they have these management interventions and these key features that are highly local. So building an understanding of both of these scales into forest management decision-making frameworks and climate change adaptation strategies is key. So to do this, the lab that I would hope to build here at ESCO Beta will embrace the geospatial data revolution to understand forest demography processes Force demography and disturbance processes across scales. And we're going to be able to ask and answer previously interactive questions. And second, we're going to be collaborative. We're going to build and contribute to inclusive, well supported teams that lead open environmental data science for forest and climate change research. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Did you have a question, Dan? Uh, sure, to, to get us started. Um, thank you. I really enjoyed the presentation. You know, I think we are seeing a geospatial data revolution, but I'm a little, I'm a little concerned about <clears throat> what it means for forest observation, given that it's very hard to see below the canopy. Mm -hmm. And so, could you say a little bit more about um, how you envision getting beyond that? Is it, is it mostly going to be these two D drone surveys to supplement kind of remote sensing images, or? Yeah. So actually, one thing that I'm really excited about is to uh, so there's 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 sort of two innovations with that with that drone survey. There's the, the drones itself, right, which position the camera above the canopy, which is great. Uh, but that structure for motion photogrammetry is also sort of its own innovation, right? So I can imagine efforts to use uh, what's called close-range terrestrial photogrammetry, right? So we, we might walk transects under the canopy, take pictures under the canopy, and feed it through the same kinds of algorithms in order to get the, the sort of sub-canopy structure. So, uh, you know, that could happen on its own. That could happen pairing it with the drone data. And sort of creating that uh, above and below ground sort of effect, right? So we can we can do uh, lidar surveys and that sort of thing too, and that those kind of data are becoming increasingly available, but uh, they're they're also more expensive, right? Well, well, unless the ones are really available, right? But uh, uh, you know, so some ability to do it with you know your your iPhone or a, a digital SLR camera would be would be great. So 
it's inevitable for sure. Totally. And just a real quick question. Is the open forest observatory the same thing as the California forest observatory? It's not. Great. Yeah. Good to know. So you know about that. So okay. it's in direct competition. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. very similar. So yeah. 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 Right. Also, yeah. one upward. I feel like open is the key part here, oh, right? Yeah. So we, we want to be able to give all of these data to, to everybody that might want to use them. We want to create these workflows and these uh, this ability to add your own data to it to sort of have it be cataloged as part of this broader network. Yeah. So great presentation and the, the sort of bringing together of these kind of really disparate data sets to answer three questions. One concern I have is the potential to overlook some of the mechanisms, um, mm -hmm. you know, you brought up the tub spire, for example, and you explained it with the VPD, mm -hmm. but the VPD was likely a function of a change in wind, right? It was a northeast wind that pushed that fire mm -hmm. uh, at night. It just happened to be at night, um, and that was really the driver, right? And that, you know, that's that's one example. Um, another one I picked up on was in your your in your detections of of night burning. Uh, particularly in Western North America, an alternate explanation is the increased use of burnouts by suppression crews. Right, that is that is something that has been on the rise for the last probably twenty years, um, and a lot of that is is at nighttime. It's when it's safer to do burnouts. And I'm not. I think you do work at, at a large enough scale where you could probably overlook some of those mechanisms. Mm -hmm. But I would just you know I'm just pointing out the fact that there is. You can go so great with, with data that you actually miss some of those those mechanisms, and I just uh, wanted to make that point. But I still do think that the work with me, I just think it's it's also nice to have a foot in the ground with some of that. That's all. It's really common, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and it, I I guess I would say that uh, that speaks to the value of collaborating with folks on the ground too, right? So that that drone. Yeah, we still have a purpose here. Yeah, no, 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 I think that any way that comes in and says that oh data science is the answer and that's the only thing that we need to do, I, I think that that's that's I don't share that opinion, right? So I, I feel like that that field data collection being there on the ground, that more nuanced understanding, that place-based knowledge is, is super important. So what do you think the real value added of the kind of big geospatial data science? Process? Yeah, that's a good question. So I you know I think I think scaling up our research to 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 be able to ask what is the what is the general. What is the average condition for, for this particular system, right? So, so uh, yeah, whereas getting really fine granularity from, from field data tells us a lot about that particular place, you know, it doesn't necessarily tell us as much about, uh, you know, what is what is the average behavior of this whole system. So, uh, yeah, I so guess I would say it's that, it's that scaling up to sort of make more generalizable statements about, about these systems that we care about. That's what Trevor had to say. Yeah, that's a similar question to pull out about the First off, I love this uh, data, open science. Very much a big fan. Uh, so thank you for that. And I was just wondering about BPD. It's like, you know, BPD is a strong functional temperature in itself. Mm -hmm. um, the nighttime high BPD, I was wondering to what extent that could be due to the heating from the fire rather than the cause of the fire. So the, the causal relationship, the statistical correlation is often difficult to discern, but for that in particular, I was wondering what your thoughts were. Yeah, so I uh, uh, make sure I'm understanding. So are you, are you saying that the the BPD could have been elevated because of the fire itself. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So this particular data set that we're using uh, is is error five reanalysis data, right? So it's this, this sort of combination, uh, this climatological data. It's a combination of uh, you know observations, but also process based models, right? So I, I my understanding is that those are not incorporating events like fires as they're happening. Right. Right. Yes. So so in this, uh, I think that's generally an important point, right? But yeah. but I think in this particular case, that's, that's probably not what's uh, what's happening. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Well, everybody, I think it's a, a couple of minutes after, so I appreciate everybody being here. Tomorrow we have a, a chalk talk at 11 o'clock to 12. 11 o'clock to 12 is a chalk talk, so I'm sure we'll hear some more things from uh, Mike tomorrow. So if you could attend, we appreciate it. Thank you very much.